So I, I think one of our main problems is that we, as you know, broadly in society, um, think that oh, we give science um, too much credit or too much validity, if you like, that, that things that we all knew were true are no longer true unless they've been re-established by science. And even that, you know, the standard statistical tests assume that everything is, is they assume the null hypothesis. So nothing that's been understood so far actually counts for anything until we've done this experiment. It seems that that creates a, a great crisis of intellectual confidence or a, a, a reluctance to actually appreciate our own heritage, um, which seems to me to be a, a huge human loss. Is this something that you think scientists encourage or are at fault with, or do you actually, um, do, do you think that that's right, actually, that, that um, science is taken to be something it actually isn't, or is taken to make it, to, to have a right to greater claims that it actually has? Forty years ago, science had much more of a status, I think, than in the way it does mm. now. I think mm. there's been a kind of fall in status of, mm. of, of science and scientific ex experts. Michael Gove thinks that the, the experts are all wrong or not to be trusted. Mm. Um, and maybe in the past, uh, what you're saying had, uh, my impression is, had perhaps more validity than it does now, that there was a tendency to think that we have to hand it over to the experts mm. to decide these things for us. I think the thing that I would want to say about it is sort of a little bit different from your question, but it, mm. it certainly is relevant to it. And that is um, that what, it, it's sort of the continuation of the argument that I was mm. indicating before, that it, it, it then occurred to me that th this idea about the nature of science, that we need to appreciate mm. uh, that the, that the basic intellectual aims of science are deeply problematic, mm -hmm. likely to, you know, we're likely to be making false assumptions of various kinds, and so we need sustained thinking about these assumptions so that we can try and improve them by exploring possibilities and critically mm -hmm. assessing them. Um, this is, has a much broader application because it, it, it isn't just in science that our aims are problematic, but in life too our aims are yeah. problematic. Um, and especially if we take seriously the task of trying to make progress towards a better world, a more civilised world, a world where all the horrific things that go on and present in the world don't happen, or don't happen as frequently as they do now, um, this is deeply problematic. Not how do we get there, but where do we want to go? What, what do we mean by civilization? What, what should we be trying to achieve? What kind of world order should we be trying to achieve? Um, what is possible and what is desirable. Um, and so this uh, enterprise of trying to make social progress towards a wise, civilised world, uh, the, the aim is deeply problematic. So we have to put the same kind of methodology, a kind of generalised version of this idea of, 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 of scientific method that I was talking about, which I call amorative empiricism. We need to, we need to generalise that to a, a general idea about rationality, mm. about what, how to proceed when your aims are problematic, mm. and then get that into social life, into all our other social endeavours mm. besides science, so we can get into the social world something of the kind of progressive success that we find in mm. science. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, one could think of that, that that really ought to be the basic task uh, to try and work out w what this would involve and how we could do it, how we could get into government, mm. into industry, into agriculture, I into the media, into the law, into education, into all these aspects of our so and into our personal lives as well, how we could get this aim-improving conception of rationality uh, into into social life, um, that 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 it should be the task of, of of social inquiry and the humanities to help work out how how to do this, what what it would involve, and what what we, how we need to do it.
and so, and there is a kind of terrible failure mm. of, of of social so-called social science mm. to do this because mm. social science I mean, it all goes back to the Enlightenment in the 18th mm. century. Mm. They 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 did actually have this idea, the Enlightenment, the philos especially the French Enlightenment, mm. that mm. Voltaire and Diderot and the others that we should try and learn from progress in 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 natural philosophy, as mm. they have called science, how to achieve social progress towards mm. an enlightened world. But they thought that that meant developing the social sciences alongside the natural sciences. They thought, first of all, we have to improve our knowledge of mm. social, the social world, the human world, uh, and then Put apply the person it. under the microscope somehow. So, yeah. yes, so mm. no, um, they set about developing mm. the various social sciences, mm. psychology and economics mm. and yeah. sociology and anthropology, and then these got developed in the 19th century mm. and built into mm. academia in the 20th century. So that, so that at the, acad the whole academic enterprise is, is, is in a way, implementing mm. this Enlightenment idea. Mm. But, but, the, but this version of the Enlightenment mm. idea is, is, is a horrible, dysfunctional version, an, an irrational mm. version. Because so we, it's, we could actually be learning from communities that work well. Or yes. If we elucidate, first look at the question, what would it mean for a community to work well? And can we find such well, communities? Well, it, it would be a, a, mm. a, if what, what, I, I, what, what I'm arguing is that mm. instead, of, instead of the project, the task of, of social inquiry being mm. to, first of all, improve knowledge of mm. social phenomena, then apply this knowledge mm. to help solve social, social problems, the task should be to help get into, into social life in, mm. into our other institutional endeavours besides science, progress-achieving methods mm. that are generalised mm. from the progress-achieving methods of science. So it means that social inquiry is more like social methodology mm. or social philosophy mm -hmm. rather than social science. Mm. Of course, the pursuit of knowledge is important, but it's a kind of secondary mm. role yeah. to help us find out what our problems are mm. and to uh, assess proposals for action. Mm. But the primary intellectual activity of social inquiry would be exploring proposals for action, uh, seeking how we might solve our, our problems of living, and, and trying to get into social life. Mm. Uh, methodologies, this conception of rationality that, that, that helps us to, to develop ideas, uh, improve our aims and methods as we act. Mm as we proceed. Um, so what we have is, is, a, is a wonderful idea. The body is a wonderful idea, but it's a kind of botched version of this wonderful idea. And what we, I think, our pri this is our fundamental failure. Mm. Uh, the thing that is, that, that is responsible for, the, for, for many of the ills of the modern world and our, our incapacity to deal with them. And, you know, because, because in the end, it, in the end, it's a problem of learning, mm. and it, we need to. We, we we there are these. Sometimes they put it like this: there are these two great problems of learning: learning about the nature of the universe, and learning about ourselves and other living things as a part of the universe, <laughs> and learning how to become mm. civilized. Yeah. We solved the first great problem of learning. Mm -hmm. We did that when we created modern science. To say that is not to say we know everything there is to be known, mm. but we've got we've discovered this method scientific method, which it helps us to progressively improve our knowledge and understanding of what kind of universe this is. Mm. And we're making real success there. Mm. But we haven't solved the second problem. Mm. You know, we're, there are some successes, but there are appalling failures, and we're not doing too well when it mm. comes to having a civilised world. We wouldn't be treating children the way we treat them in the mm. world today if we were civilised. And solving the first problem not solving the second problem puts us into a situation of very great danger mm. because solving the first problem leads to enormous enhanced powers to act. Yes. Science and technology enables us mm. to do all sorts of things via modern industry mm. and, uh, uh, and agriculture mm. and armaments and mm. medicine and those in turn lead to all our current mm. global problems, uh, yeah. like population growth and yeah. global warming and uh, destruction of habitats and extinction of species and all the other pollution and all the other disasters. Like leaving a, a small child in, in, yes. in uh, charge uh, of a, a And the real problem is not science yeah. and technology, it's science and technology mm. and the enormous power it gives us to act mm. and not having the wisdom mm. to use mm. it wisely. Mm. 
And so it's become, a, you know, what in the old days, wisdom was a kind of uh, private luxury, if you like, mm. but now it's become a public necessity. Mm. We mm. absolutely need to learn how to be wiser. And the really important thing to appreciate is there's something very important to be learned from science about how to make social progress, how to become wiser. And that's what my whole argument is mm. about, that we can learn from the way science make pro makes progress about how to make social progress towards a, towards a, a wiser world. Could and you put that in a... Is, is there one sort of sentence or a couple of sentences that could get to the nub of that? What is it about science? In my view, what what got science going mm. it, it, with, with the work of Kepler and Galileo mm. And, mm. and Newton and mm. Hooke and others was this combination of a view of the nature of the universe, mm. uh, as, as Galileo put it, uh, the, that the, the book of nature is written in the language of mm. mathematics, that, mm. there are, that there are laws governing mm. the way phenomena unfold, mm. plus observation and experimentation, plus uh, th this process of which sort of Popper mm. uh, spells out of, of putting forward conjectures of this type mm. and then mm. subjecting them to, for example, Kepler mm. in trying to uh, improve our, our knowledge of, of, of the solar system. Mm. Um, and he had the, the uh, obs very careful observations that Tycho Brahe mm. had, had mm. made. Uh, uh, and he realized, he discovered that um, the planets didn't move in precise mm. circles around um, the sun. And then he, one stage, he, I believe he thought they moved in a kind of egg shape, mm. which he was absolutely horrified by. Mm. But then he discovered um, that they moved in ellipses. And of course, an ellipse is a kind of generalization of the circle. Mm. Um, and he, what, what, what he firmly believed was that there were these laws mm. Ma mathematically formulatable laws governing the motions of the planets. And, and Galileo believed something similar, both, both for the heavens and, mm. and for terrestrial phenomena. Mm. Um, so it's that combination uh, of a, a vision of the universe, uh, a, a vision of what it is that makes phenomena occur mm. in the way that they do, and then the, the experimental method, mm. those two things together. That's, that's kind of unique to, to Europe uh, mm. in the 16th, 17th century. Mm. Mm. Uh, for example, in China, um, they'd had made all sorts of technological discoveries way ahead of, yes, uh, yeah. of Europe, yeah. um, but they never had science. And, and there's, it's even regarded as a, it's kind of, I think it's called the Needham question. Why on earth didn't mm. the Chinese discover science? Mm. Well, I think the answer is very simple. They, they didn't have this vision of the natural world. So they, I think they, you have to take it back. The Renaissance is, is the rebirth of, the, of classical civilization mm. in Europe, mm. it's the rediscovery, mm. particularly of the Greeks, mm. um, with the fall of Constantinople, largely, the, obviously, from the medieval texts of Aristotle and so forth in the, that had been in the universities throughout the Middle Ages. Well, you and, know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a remark that uh, Richard Feynman makes in his mm. uh, lectures on physics, where he says, if supposing all our scientific knowledge was destroyed overnight mm. um, and all memory of it was destroyed, mm. and, but you're allowed one sentence oh. in, in order to get people going again, um, to, to you know, to tr transmit uh, an item, the most mm. important item of scientific knowledge that there is, and uh, Feynman said, "Well, it should be the world is made up of atoms," mm. and of course, you know, that came from mm. Democritus. It's, it's a Democritus, yeah. yes, yeah. So there's a very interesting thing with Greek philosophy because I, th I think it was influenced by um, Hindu ideas or certainly um, Indian ideas. Of, eternity and the vast cosmos and um, the lack of a, a creator as such or to um, so uh, and the importance of contemplation so it puts them in a different mental state but these are 
seafarers, they're technologists, they're curious people, they're outward going, if you like. And there are lots of them from different cities and they're all arguing with each other. So you have this strange thing of it, what had become, been a sort of religious or philosophical contemplative tradition becomes a very active, almost, I wouldn't say a, aggressive perhaps, but it's something driven by curiosity. Well, the, the, there's, a, there's an like. interesting suggestion that I think Popper makes somewhere, possibly mm. in a footnote in um, The Open Society and Its Enemies, that mm. um, that these different parts of, of Greece, of that mm. part of the Mediterranean, had the, these different religious beliefs. Mm. And then they, through trade and so on, they yeah. got to know of each other. Yeah. And then they had the problem of, of rationalizing the, mm. the, the different religious yeah. systems yeah. they had. So they invented all these gods who yeah. behaved like, oh, like adolescents. <laughs> and, you know, and, then, yeah. and then you couldn't really sort of, OK, there were the gods, but uh, they, were, yeah. they, were, they got jealous. They you know, did all these pretty uh, childish things. So you couldn't really quite <laughs> have full respect for them. And so they, you know, so it was so it kind of liberated mm. these thinkers mm. to to start thinking about the world independently of God. I think that's a little bit fanciful, to be honest with you, because the gods are all over the place. But mm. this intellectual tradition doesn't seem to have started anywhere else but Greece. No, so, well, that, 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 that's what he was suggesting. Mm, that, yeah. that unusually in Greece, uh, mm. the, the, the the religious Absolutely. views were so. Uh, sort of I mean, full of drama and so on, yes, yeah. but not sort of awe-inspiring exactly. No, so, so, no. It became, so it became easier for, for some to be liberated from thinking of uh, the, that it was anything more than fairy tales. Mm, mm. Uh, notions of, of a place in cosmology that's not dominated by, by the gods, but not in, only in ancient Greece, but also in India and, and China. So we have the uh, Taoism in China, um, what, what I think is, what what I think has been very difficult for humanity to come mm. to terms with, is the idea that, I mean, we have these two modes of understanding, mm. if you like, or maybe, maybe there are more, but there are at least two, mm. uh, where we understand things, uh, taking ourselves as a kind of uh, litmus paper for. Comprehensibility. So we understand things in personalistic terms yes. or in purposive terms. Mm. That something mm. has a goal, mm. and we explain what this mm. thing does in terms of seeking to realize the goal. Mm. Um, animistic explanations mm. or purposive mm. explanations. Right. And then on the other hand, there, 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 there is the kind of explanations that we find in in, in modern science and in mm. Mm. supremely, if you like, in theoretical physics, that. Um, Phenomena obey precise laws, mm. um, and I would go on to say unified laws, mm. Mm. Um, pattern of law. Mm. Um, and that second one is sort of deeply uncongenial to us as mm. human beings. Mm. And we, we have to remember that we are social beings. Mm. We, for millions of years, and before we became human, but then as we became human, um, we were living in small, scattered hunting and gathering tribes where it was really important to understand your fellow human beings for all sorts of reasons. Mm. Um, so that our, our prime, our kind of gut mode of understanding is the way we understand each other mm. and ourselves. Mm. And so it's not surprising that we should have projected that out into mm. the natural world mm. and tried to understand the natural world mm. in the same sort of way. Mm. And you, you can see how incredibly difficult it is for humanity to come to terms with the idea that that is actually not the way to understand mm. the natural world. Because people, you know, I, I, I don't know what the percentage is of the world population that still believes in God or gods, but, but it's probably uh, more than 50%. Mm. Um, and, uh, it still lingers on. Mm. It, we find it very difficult to, to come to terms with this, I think, and, and, and part of the problem is science muffs its uh, discovery. One of the most profound intellectual discoveries that, in my view, that science has made, modern science has made, is that the universe is, is, 
is physically comprehensible, uh, comprehensible in this unappealing kind of way. I mean, in some senses unappealing. You know, if you read Einstein, he found it amazing mm. and mm. wonderful. And uh, for him, it was a kind of science, was a, theoretical physics was a kind of religious endeavor. But for most people, it, it's just sort of disturbing. Mm. And uh, partly because it also means that we're caught up in this. Mm. Too. It's disturbing about, you know, what happens to free will, what happens to human life. Mm.